Okay, so I guess we'll go ahead and get started now. Um, my name is Richard Gass. Um, I'm a physicist at the University of Cincinnati, and um, I want to tell you about some uh, home physics labs that you can do using Mathematica on your phone. Okay, so um, I'm going to skip the abstract because you can all read the abstract. Um, okay, and uh, sort of go right into the uh, meat of things, okay? So with COVID, labs, of course, pose a special challenge. It's very difficult or impossible to social distance in labs. And um, we, of course, have to plan for the worst case, which is that the university could close completely, um, or we could undergo another lockdown. Um, so there are possible solutions, all of which have pluses and minuses. Um, so you can, of course, try to social distance, maybe in multiple rooms or with a subset of the students. Okay. Um, you could use simulated labs. The downside of that is that you don't have real data in a simulated lab, although it can be very valuable. Um, doesn't teach the students everything that a real lab does. Um, you could have students do computational labs. Um, once again, that's not really a lab, um, although uh, in the course that I'm going to talk about, we do do a number of computational labs. You could have students do real data, use real data from, say, NASA or European Space Agency, LIGO, and so on. Um, that might not fit your existing curriculum very well, or they could do citizen science projects. Okay. Or you could have students do home labs or projects, which is the subject of this talk. In our advanced lab taken by the seniors, our, our senior majors, uh, we're currently using a mix of these approaches. Um, but I teach a course called Intermediate Physics. Okay. Um, and I also have responsibility for historical reasons for our first year majors lab. Um, and these are relatively small courses, which is to say they have uh, 30 to 40 students in them. Uh, the Intermediate Physics Lab is the course I'm really going to talk about. It's required of all our second year majors. Um, it's a five credit course with four lectures a week plus a lab that is attached to the course and it's combined so you get a single grade. Okay, and the the focus of the first semester is waves and vibrations with a little special relativity thrown in at the end. And then the second semester, we do special relativity and quantum mechanics. Okay. And I was trying to think of what I could do for the labs. Okay. And there's an old Berkeley series book on waves by Frank Crawford, which has home experiments. So I thought, well, maybe I can just kind of swipe those, okay? Um, but the focus of those is somewhat different because they're to uh, support a, you know, a course that has a real physical in-person lab in it. And it's a bit dated. My students, for instance, don't have access to turntables and so on. But what they all do have is a smartphone and they all have a laptop because we require them to have a laptop. And they all have Mathematica on their laptop because we have a university-wide site license. So although it is not free for them, the central IT people charge them for that, it's still relatively inexpensive. So we require our majors all to have Mathematica. Okay. So you can use the data from both sensors and video on the smartphone and and there are various apps such as um, Physics Toolbox or Firefox, which give direct access to the, sen to the sensor data. And these run on um, both Android and iOS, and the apps are free. Okay. So the advantage to this is that you get real experiments with real data. I'll show you that the data quality can be extremely high. Okay. It's as is always the case with real data, it's richer than, than simulated data. There are you know, things that you don't quite understand about real data always. 
the disadvantages are that you have to redo your entire lab, lab curriculum, write new lab write-ups for all these labs, so it's a lot of work. Um, we put together student kits that we ship to our students um, because I couldn't depend on them necessarily having any particular item. And I had to plan for the case where uh, the county might start to be locked down again. Um, and it wouldn't be easy for them to get various pieces of equipment. Okay. And then at home experiments are hard. There's no TA there sits, you know, sitting in front of you. They, they do have a virtual, they do have a TA over Zoom, but uh, you know, the experiments aren't set up with the equipment collected for you and so on. So I worry about students getting frustrated. It's worked okay so far, but uh, we're not through the semester yet. And I worry about maintaining student engagement on a remote experiment, and there may be issues that uh, just haven't cropped up yet. But I want to give you four examples. Okay, one of them is a simple pendulum. Okay, one of them is a Helmholtz resonator, and then the two richest ones are a coupled oscillator and waves on a string. And these all fit well into the curriculum for me because this is a course on waves and vibrations, starting with simple harmonic motion and moving on to waves in a continuous medium and traveling waves and, and so on. Um, so we, start, we started the semester with a session that was basically get to know one another. Do you have Mathematica installed on your laptop? Does it work? And so on. And then the first lab they did was a simple pendulum lab. Um, and so the idea behind this and most of these labs is that we will leverage the ability of your smartphone to take really high quality data with the ability of Mathematica to do automatic feature tracking. So here's the, uh, my home setup. You'll see it's just a, uh, it's actually a large washer hung from a weight and a door hanger with a background behind it and a couple of tape marks. Okay. Um, and these tape marks uh, you won't really see here, but they've got 10 centimeter marks on them so that I can convert uh, distances in a picture to actual physical distances. So we shipped them um, door hangers. We shipped them washers, string, masking tape, uh, marking pens, and perhaps most critically, um, tripods uh, that would hold their uh, smartphone. So they just pull the pendulum back at a small angle okay, and film the motion. Okay. We import the movie into Mathematica and we use video extract frames to extract all of the frames. Okay. And uh, if necessary, then image rotate to rotate the images. Um, if you didn't have your smartphone in the proper orientation, I didn't, so I had to rotate them by uh, pi over two. And then they click on, okay, there should be a picture here. They click on the pendulum bob here, and there's a red tracking dot that I put here and they click on that with the coordinate tool, okay, from the drawing tools to extract the coordinates of that, which they then feed to image feature track, okay. So rotated images, these are the list of properly rotated images from their movie. And here we have the, um, the coordinates of the object they want to track, okay. And so they track that throughout their video frame, throughout their right, list of uh, frames. And then for this lab, they also need to measure uh, the local acceleration of gravity. Uh, so they do that using their, uh, their phone and uh, the Firefox app, which allows them to export that acceleration as a .xls file, which they then import into Mathematica. Um, 
and uh, Okay, I'll show you those results in a moment. One thing we hadn't anticipated really was that some students had dropped their phone so often that their sensor no longer worked very well. So there were a couple students we had to uh, ship data to for measuring small g. Okay, so once they have the feature tracked using image feature track, right, and now they have Mathematica, which is a really powerful tool, of course, for analysis. So here I'm showing you a plot of the horizontal displacement from equilibrium. This has been now converted into physical distances. Um, I shot this video at 30 frames a second. There's no need to be faster for this experiment. I'll show you an experiment later where there is. Um, and you can see it's really high quality data. There's a little scatter, but really not very much at all. The fit to the data is um, is quite good. Um, and of course, they can use the uh, fit parameters to determine an error here in the, in the frequency. They need to measure G, of course, as a function of time because they want to compare their measured frequency to the experimental frequency frequency. So they get some scatter here from using their sensor, right? They can take the mean of that, look at the standard deviation, right? I mean, this is all really easy to do in Mathematica and also introduces them to, you know, ideas of statistical uncertainty and so forth. Um, these are second year students. So in theory, they knew some of this from first year, but in practice, um, that's been long forgotten. And so they can now compare um, you know, and here we're using the new, well, relatively new um, error bar um, capabilities of Mathematica. They can compare their theory to experiment, and you'll notice, right, uh, right, the the scale here. So they've actually made a very precise, quite a precise measurement of the period of the uh, pendulum. The theoretical error is much larger than the experiment because this error is dominated by the ability to measure the length of the string to the center of mass of uh, their, uh, the nut that they are using as a pendulum bob. Uh, we shipped them uh, uh, cheap tape measures um, as well and, and their home experiment kit. Um, so, the next experiment I wanted to, well, so what happens then in the curriculum is that we actually have a two week pause in physical experiments. We do two weeks of, um, of linear algebra, uh, both by hand and, um, and in Mathematica. Uh, okay. uh, their linear algebra tends to be a little weak, okay? So the next experiment is uh, then a Helmholtz resonator. Um, thinking about now air as a spring. Um, and so this is the sort of the easiest experiment. Uh, they need a bottle and a ruler and a measuring cup and a smartphone. So you blow across the bottle, you use your smartphone app to record the frequencies, which you then import in, which you export as an XLS file, import that into Mathematica. You then add water to the bottle to change the volume, okay? And you can plot the theoretical value for the frequency of a Helmholtz resonator, okay, as a function of the, right, of the volume of your bottle. Um, you can see here that the experimental points mostly lie below the theoretical points. Um, and that's because this model is only a, kind of approximation. Um, you've got this effective length of the neck, which tells you really how much, how big the plug of air is that you push down when you blow across it. And this is kind of empirical. And so it's typical that you don't fit the theory exactly, but this allows them to, um, to think about what happens when your theoretical model isn't exactly perfect either. Uh, and this is an experiment that they're currently uh, finishing up. And then next week, they'll start a 
coupled oscillator experiment. Okay, uh, this experiment turns out to be extraordinarily rich, actually richer than I'd originally realized. And so you can see my setup at home. Um, I've got two springs and two masses. You can see just kind of barely a couple of small blue tracking dots. Um, here, in general, small dots work better than larger dots for the video tracking. You can see that I did a actually exceptionally poor job here of orienting my dot, okay? But nevertheless, um, image feature track is able to, um, to track this. So um, I filmed this once again at about 30 frames, well, not about, at 30 frames a second. Um, and I followed the oscillators for about um, 40 seconds, I believe. Um, you know, brought the images into Mathematica, rotated them to fix the fact that I didn't have my smartphone clamped at the right angle. Here we feature track two objects, and the objects we're feature tracking are these two dots here. Feature image feature track does a amazingly good job, um, provided you don't have motion blur, okay, and provided the object never leaves the frame. I haven't been able to get it really to reacquire an object that leaves the frame and then comes back. And motion blur will kill the um, feature tracking as well. Okay, but okay, here I've tracked. Um, right, a, th a thousand three hundred and sixty-nine frames. So of course, there's no way you could do this by hand. Um, this is really one of the strengths of automated feature tracking in Mathematica. And you'll see I've been able to track both the vertical and horizontal motion of both masses. M1 is the top mass, and M2 is the bottom mass. Okay. Um, if you look at the scale, you'll see that the motion, the horizontal motion of these two masses is less than the vertical motion. But um, okay, in the case of the bottom one, not that much less. And this is just because I could never really right, pull the bottom mass down right, completely vertically. There was always some little horizontal displacement. Um, and so what I really have is not an object with two normal modes, but an object with four normal modes, because there are going to be essentially spring modes from the oscillation up and down, and also some pendulum modes from the uh, horizontal oscillation. Okay. Um, and we could take this data and take the Fourier transform of that data okay, and pick out the frequencies. And I've done that here, okay? So uh, this is for uh, the, uh, this is for M1, this is the vertical motion, right, of the top mass, um, but you get um, essentially the same thing, although the relative strengths of the amplitudes are different if you look at either the horizontal motion or the motion of the other mass. Um, You'll see there are four peaks here corresponding to the four normal modes. Um, I've listed the angular frequencies here, and we can identify from the theory um, these modes that this one is really corresponding to the low frequency spring mode. Then we have a low frequency pendulum mode, which for my setup happens to lie very close to the spring mode. Um, there's a high frequency pendulum mode and a high frequency spring mode. Okay. Um, strictly speaking, these the spring and the pendulum modes don't really decouple, except that in this small uh, small motion limit they do. Um, and we can then compute from theory, right? Because they do a um, first part of this experiment, they measure the spring constant. We also shipped them um, uh, small digital scales. Those are cheap. Um, 
so they could measure the masses and so on. Um, and we've talked about normal modes and oscillations of these sorts of systems in lecture, right? So there's a theory section where they compute these things. You can see that the agreement between theory and experiment here is really good. Um, and I mean, I'm, I'm just really impressed by the ability of uh, cell phones and feature tracking to, uh, to take really high quality data. So the last experiment I want to talk about is waves on an elastic string. One of the things that we've just started in lecture, we haven't gotten there in lab yet, um, is right, uh, waves in a continuous medium. Okay? So uh, we shipped them uh, some elastic string. Okay? And here you see my setup. Um, in the beginning, I was really worried about providing a uniform background. Um, it turns out that feature image feature track really is pretty good if the background isn't uniform. But and so I just took this and I stretched the string and I put these uh, you know red marks here with a red marker um, and you can see some and then I took the string and I pulled it down okay, and let it go. Now this gets filmed at the fastest rate your smartphone will do, which in my case is 240 frames a second. Uh, and this early motion here, image feature track actually fails to track because there is still, uh, it's a little hard to see here, but there's still too much motion blur. Okay, so it loses the, um, the red dots. But if you wait a little while and just uh, trim your video, until that, some of that motion blur disappears, it will track, okay? And so here, what I'm showing you, um, okay, I track a little over 3,000 frames, okay, uh, with, uh, you know, the ends plus uh, nine data points uh, from these uh, red dots. So we're accumulating over 30,000 pieces of data. And here I'm showing you the transverse displacement at a fixed point on the, on the uh, string, one of the red marks that's close to the center. The insert here shows you this short time motion. See, it's pretty nice and periodic, okay? But there are a couple of, and, right, I can now extract that motion from all the dots, okay? And plot that as a function of time. It looks like what a damped elastic string should look like, okay? And then, of course, I can use um, some Fourier analysis to fish out the, uh, the string frequencies. Um, and I've done this two ways. I've extracted a string, the frequency from the early time data just by fitting it. Okay? And I've extracted them with a Fourier transform. And with the Fourier transform, we see actually that we can see two modes here. The others have decayed away. Uh, okay. uh, but the fundamental mode here, and then at almost exactly twice that, we see small amplitude of a second mode that got excited when I pulled the string down. Um, so with a a smartphone and image feature track, you can really extract very high quality, rich data from um, quite complicated physical systems. And I actually think that when we return to you know, physical labs, uh, we will want to rethink some of them and ask, you know, what can we do using um, the ability to track many frames of video and high quality video from a smartphone uh, to do interesting physics experiments. And uh, for those that are interested, I've just listed, um, you know, what we sent them for these experiments. Um, we needed to keep it cheap because, right, our university's in financial straits due to COVID. Um, but um, I've uh, left a little time for questions, so I'd be, uh, more than happy to answer uh, any questions you might have.
Okay, and um, I believe uh, Brandon can unmute you too if you wish to ask a uh, a question by um, by talking rather than typing. Okay, so any questions at all? Um, we have one question in the Pathable chat. Yes. Um, uh, are you yeah, missing well, it? I'm, uh, yeah, I'm bringing that up now, so, uh, but I don't see, uh, here we go, it's just a little slow loading. Uh, uh, Oh, uh, oh, yeah. So Jose wants uh, wants a comment on the error analysis. Um, yeah. So um, so our students are terrible at error analysis, um, which I think uh, you know most students are. So I thought one thing that I would take advantage of here is the advantage to really do a little more error analysis than we normally do. Um, and um, so what I, uh, there's a um, early discussion, there's a separate error analysis notebook um, where we make them do the error analysis really by hand, okay? Um, and then we make heavy use of around, okay? To propagate errors and uh, we make, um, you know, use of the uh, fit parameters from uh, find fit and nonlinear fit uh, to get those errors. And so one of the things I really tried to emphasize this time is if you're going to compare theory to experiment, you've got to understand your errors. Um, I see some other questions. So I have, um, okay, I don't know if I really answered Jose's question satisfactorily. But uh, the slides have been uploaded, uh, so they should be under files. Um, and then there's a question from uh, Danielle about um, the uh, the dot mb files. Um, you know that lie behind this that really explain the labs that you um, didn't uh, see. So I can um, I'll go ahead and upload those. Um, to uh, the files uh, later this afternoon. And I'll upload not only the .mb files, um, but I'll upload the uh, video and I'll try to do that with a sensible directory structure so that if you wish to import the video and play around yourself, uh, you can do that. Okay, we've got a couple more minutes before we'll um, uh, get cut off. So if there are any other questions. Um, so I see that Jeff said something about um, uh, some of these could be adopted for high school students. Um, I certainly think the um, Helmholtz resonator um, could be done well and the simple harmonic motion labs um, I think those could be done by high school students uh, without a doubt. Um, we have done for our first year students, um, they normally do an air track experiment with uh, PASCO sensors. Um, I've redone that using um, video tracking, um, which actually produces far superior data to the um, PASCO sensors, and there, unfortunately, we're just going to have to ship the students the uh, the video files and have them uh, work from those because, of course, right, they don't have air tracks at home. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, any other questions? Okay. So, if there are no other questions, then I'll. Uh, I guess I'll uh, go ahead and uh, stop the share and um, end the meeting.